pastoral theology and practice. However, and this is what I want you to understand, they're not for studying by practice by pastors alone. See, everything the Word of God tells pastors to do, it tells you to do too. The only difference is it says the pastor's supposed to do it first to be an example. I, I was uh, humored when Samuel was a little earlier in age and he was around here. Uh, he worked at Chick-fil-A and he had a bunch of other people out here work Chick-fil-A about his age. And, and he, he, was, he was the guy that taught them to tithe. He's like, if I have to, you have to. <laughs> right? If I'm supposed to, you're supposed to. We'll, we'll put it a little more delicate. But that's how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to do it first. They do provide the preacher or the pastor instruction concerning his role in the church and concerning his personal relationship with the members of the church. And they teach us what the New Testament church should be and give us instructions concerning church order, sound doctrine, and church discipline. Pure doctrine, pure worship, and a faithful ministry are the leading thoughts of the book of 1 Timothy. And an inspired Paul also enters into discussion of godly conduct of the individuals who compose, this is his phrase, the church of the living God. Contained in this book are blessed instructions which sorely need to be heeded in the days in which we live. I say that because we see failure in every eternal life's journey of service to God. Departure from the faith is going to be a theme that's happening today. People will not endure sound doctrine. He speaks about that in 1 Timothy 1.10, again in 2 Timothy 4.3 more directly. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 1. That talks about departure from the established worship patterns. There's some things going around today. People say, well, this is the way it really ought to be. Really? Well, why did we just now come about to, to learning about it? If that's the way that uh, God really wanted it all. So we've been doing it wrong all this time, right? There's departure from established worship patterns. There's departure from ministry. So many who are called to ministry are not faithful. You look around today, there's a shortage of preachers and pastors for churches. I personally believe God's still calling, but people are not being faithful to enter the ministry at all. Some who get in are not faithful to remain there until the end. So as Paul is going to tell us before he's done here, they're not in it to finish their course, to run their race and be faithful unto the end. Departure from the established patterns of godly conduct. We must remember that during the transition period, uh, we call in the apostolic age, the apostles had authority and regulated these things. You understand, but toward the end of that age, as the apostles died off and the number of churches increased, it became necessary that a clear set of instructions be set down for churches to follow. Well-defined procedures were required. The key verse of 1 Timothy is found in chapter 3 and verse 15. Where he says, but if I tarry long, if I'm delayed for a period of time, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The Old Testament, the question is asked, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? We live in a day where the devil and his emissaries are trying to erode the foundations. Notice the salutation or the introduction in verses 1 2. Notice, first of all, the writer in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to an express commandment of God our Savior and according to our particular hope or expectation, Jesus Christ. So Paul is the author of this divinely inspired letter. He openly asserts that he is an apostle. Just as surely as those sent out before him. Now, I don't know if you've been around for a little while. You know there's great argument about whether Paul is the 12th apostle, Matthias was a mistake, and, and all that. I think if you've been around here very long, you, you understand my position. The Word of God says Matthias got Judas' his spot. Paul was an apostle, a special apostle to the Gentiles. He never claimed to be part of the 12. Listen to his words in 1 Corinthians 9 1. He asked a question to them. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? 
Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my word in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are you in the Lord. He said these Corinthians were the, the uh, proof that he was an apostle. In chapter 15 of the book of Galatians, in verse number 8, I mean 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he says, And last of all, he spoke about the apostles, Last of all, Jesus was seen of me as one born out of due time. He says in the next verse, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not me or worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Thus we understand that in the manner of early writers, Paul names himself as the author, then states his official position. You understand, I'm an apostle. Thus giving his authority to say what will be said. And although the greeting may seem very formal, since it's addressed to a close friend, we must remember that the contents of the letter were for official and not merely private use. See, Timothy and future pastors have a right to act according to these instructions in these matters. That's what he calls them. Paul did not need to emphasize the authority he had been given to Timothy. Timothy knew it. See, so it's written here to, as we conclude for those who would follow him. I want to devote a little time to fully comprehending this title, and that's what it is, Apostle. Now, there's a generic use of the word apostle, and there's a technical use for it. I want you to understand the difference tonight, okay? Etymologically, it means one who is equipped to fulfill his responsibility. Apostle is one of those transliterations. The Greek word is apostle. We just changed the spelling and brought it over into English. So now we still need to understand what it means. Apostle is the noun form, that's Strong's number 652, of a compound Greek verb, that's 649, that's formed by prefixing the preposition apo, the uh, one that means away from, to the verb stello, 4724, which means to equip, to arrange, or to prepare. So apostelos became a technical term to denote one who was sent away with proper credentials, credentials to represent someone else. If you get the idea of an ambassador there, you'd be right on the money. See, an ambassador is sent away with proper credentials to represent someone else. In fact, Paul said to the Corinthians in his second letter, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are. We're sent for. I submit that it's a gross misuse of this title by those who claim to be apostles today. We would be safe if we were to hold very tightly to the requirements for the office of apostle as recorded in Acts chapter 1 beginning at verse 20 and going through verse 22. Here they are. For it is written in the book of Psalms. Let his habitation be desolate. He's referring to Judas. Let no man dwell therein and let his bishopric, let his office <coughs> another take. Wherefore of these men, first requirement, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out among us, qualification number two, beginning from the baptism of John the Baptist, qualification three, until the same day that he was taken up from us, qualification four, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Those four qualifications cannot be met by anyone alive today. Paul stated that he had a special exception in 1 Corinthians 15 8. Remember he said, I was one as one born out of due time. Notice he asked the Corinthians, he says, you do know I have seen the Lord, right? By way of illustration, we consider Philippians 2.25 and 2 Corinthians 8.23. In these two cases, the word apostelos is used in the generic sense and not in this technical one which we're now discussing. See, in Philippians 2.5, it says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your, there it is, your messenger, your one sent forth as an authorized representative to represent you, and he that ministered to my wants. See, he had come with an offering from those people to take care of the needs that Paul had, so they understood that word in the generic sense. 
2 Corinthians 8, 23, whether any do require inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. For of our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers, authorized, sent forth representatives with authority to represent them in the glory of Christ. See, in both these cases, the use is that of the subjective genitive, which limits the title to those who belong to God in a special way. See, these two instances only refer to official messengers, or we would call them envoys, who brought or delivered messages and or collections of money. You contrast this with Paul's salutation where it's used in the technical sense. The title referring to those men who were specially chosen and sent forth directly by Jesus Christ. The twelve, Matthias is Judas' replacement according to Acts chapter 1 and Paul. See, Acts 1, 24 through 26 make it clear. The church had authority to select Matthias and that God's stamp of approval was upon that action. See, they got it down to two. I've, I've shared this before, but I'll do it again. They got it down to two, and they said, Now, Lord, we want you to show us which of these two you would have to take his office. And I submit to you, when you understand the process they were using, God could have signified neither as well as he could have either. You understand? God, God have said, could have said, I don't want either one of these guys. Well, God said, I want this one, and I don't want that one. And he put his stamp of approval upon it. No others have been chosen in this matter but Paul, according to the Bible. Now, the UBS text has it, the order Christ Jesus, while the Texas Receptus and the King James has the order Jesus Christ. I, I trust you've noticed as you read your Bible that it's that way sometimes. Sometimes it's Christ Jesus and sometimes it's Jesus Christ. One of the great theological questions I've been asked through the years is what difference does it make? Well, I'm glad you asked. Does the order of these two words make a difference? Sometimes they're reversed simply to emphasize one over the other. Let me give you the meaning of the two words and, and maybe you'll understand. Christ is the word for Messiah. God's anointed one. That would be a, a title, if you please. It denotes the lordship and the messiahship of Jesus as God's Savior. The person of Jesus and his national and his theological function is stressed when we use the name Christ or the title Christ. Jesus is the name which God gave his son. What did he tell Mary? Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. That name literally means Savior. So it is the humanity and the historic personality of God's Son which is stressed when we use the name Jesus. See, the order of Paul's meaning of these qualifications is in inverted order. See, Paul's first meeting on the Damascus Road was with the glorified, resurrected Christ. The other disciples or the other apostles first met the historic Jesus of Nazareth. You understand? Everybody else met Jesus first. Paul met Christ first. Then he became Jesus and his Lord. But those, let me, let me say it to you this way, and we will in, in just a second. Paul points out his apostleship was by direct commandment from God. He's there in Damascus. He's blind. And, and God calls Ananias and says, I want you to go and and baptized Saul of Tarsus. And uh, Ananias was a lot like us, right? Lord, are you sure? Have, have you heard about this Saul of Tarsus <laughs> guy? <laughs> and what he's been doing? Yeah, yeah, I know all about him, Ananias. Here, here's what you need to know. Here's what the Lord said to Ananias. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. See, Paul plainly states that he was an apostle by or according to the commandment of God. Robertson said it this way. He, Paul, Paul was saying, I'm an apostle under orders. Mm -hmm. Just like in the military. He said, I got it from the commander in chief. This is my job. I've been sent to do this. The phrase connotes an order and its use of royal commandments which must be obeyed. See, this was not loving advice. But it was a commandment from God, the King of Kings, that Paul was obligated to obey. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. 
I'm glad you did because that's the same thing the commander in chief told you to do. That's fine. It's not a loving advice that we ought to go and tell our neighbors. It's a commandment that we go do that. Paul asserts that this commandment came from God our Savior. Someone observed that this points to the past aspect of God's faithfulness and salvation while the next phrase to the future. This is what I wanted to point out. Although that might be true, I believe that we should not be overly stressed about the chronological aspect. About whether it's Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus in the order that he met with him. We simply need to embrace its truth. God our Savior is inclusive of all three persons in the Godhead. All three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were and are involved in our salvation. The phrase in our Lord Jesus who is our hope or our expectation, is the phrase which looks at the future concerning our salvation in Him. It's just like we discussed this morning. We're already saved in our spirits because of what has happened. He's keeping us today in the process of sanctification. And one day Jesus is coming again and we'll be glorified with Him. That's the future part of it. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit all involved. See, our hope does lie in the life, the death, and the burial of resurrection. It is the hope of his return and the fulfilling of his promise to give us eternal life that's yet future even today. Our basis for receiving eternal life with all its glories does lie in the fact of our union with him. I love this verse in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27. He said, to whom God would make known what is the riches, notice this phrase, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hey, if you're born again tonight, you have Jesus in you in the form of his Holy Spirit. And one day we're going to get to see him face to face. That's our hope. That's our expectation. That's what Paul's talking about. Then notice the addressee in verse 2. To Timothy, a genuine son by means of faith. After initial time in the area found uh, recorded in Acts chapter 14 verses 1 through 3, Paul has left and now he's come back in chapter 16 verse 1 where it says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, or Timothy, we commonly refer to him, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewess and believed. So she was a Messianic Jew, we would call him today. She was a born-again Jewish person, but his father was a Greek. Verse 2 says, This Timothy was well reported of by the brethren that were in Lystria and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew all that his father was a Greek. I want you to understand this statement by Paul concerning Timothy being a Genuine son, by means of faith, is filled with meaning. Although Timothy was not Paul's physical child, he says that spiritually he was his child. His spiritual birth had evidently occurred at Lystra during Paul's first visit there. That was when he was stoned and left for dead, right? You, you think that would make an impression on a young man? They stone a guy, leave him for dead, and he gets up and walks away. I think I would make a pressure on a young guy like Timothy. With the passing of the years, the genuine nature of the spiritual birth had been proven as he served God in his daily living, which was attested by the brethren. Now, that's what I want you to understand. So here Paul claims Timothy as a spiritual son in the faith, which encompasses the entire sphere of Christian life. Faith in Christ, loyalty to Christ, strength in spiritual character. Then notice the greeting. Grace, mercy, peace. Away from our God, from God our Father, and away from Jesus Christ our Lord, or Christ Jesus, whichever one is saying, our particular Lord. I want you to take a little challenge with me for just a minute. Let's take the time. I really want you to see it. So I want you to open your Bibles to the first verse in the book of Romans. The first chapter in the book of Romans. 
In every book that Paul wrote, in his opening salutation, he said two things that he wanted everybody to have. In verse 7 of Romans 1, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace. You see that? Grace and peace are the two things that he said he wanted the Romans to have. If you turn and look in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Philemon, you'll find the same thing. Paul's greeting is twofold for them to receive grace and peace. Yet in these three books, the younger preachers or pastors, we find a third element added to the opening salutation or greeting. Three sweeping blessings were extended toward them. Grace, mercy, and peace. Mercy, someone said, is full favor or compassion. An emotion roused by contact with an affliction which comes undeservedly on another. It arises because of the misery that we see as the consequence of sin. See, it is this term for mercy that is the addition in these pastoral epistles. And I ask you, what should we make of this addition? Could it be that mercy is an essential of necessity for the daily frustrations of the pastor as he seeks to guide the flock? I want to ask you that question again because as Garfield says, I resemble it. Mm -hmm. Mercy is an essential of necessity for the daily frustrations of the pastor as he seeks to guide the flock. We have a football game. The players don't do what the coaches say. You, you know what they are? They're frustrated that they've taught the kids to do the right thing, and they don't go do it. And about every time they said, I said, you know, it's the same way in my job. <laughs> it's the same way in my job. I teach people what they're supposed to do according to God's Word, and then they don't go do it. It's frustrating. It is. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, after the list, Paul says of all the things that he had suffered physically for the cause of Christ, he says, besides those things that are without, he says, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I'll be honest, sometimes I don't know how Paul did it. You know, I've got one church. And it's frustrating. It, it's a burden sometimes. Mm -hmm. He said the care of all the churches. See, Paul is telling us, and he's going to continue down in chapter 12. This is where he's going with this thing of 2 Corinthians. That for this, Paul needed the all-sufficient grace of God. You know how we get that? It's always obtained by mercy. See, Paul's heart knew... <coughs> as he had found that God's heart always knows the field of labor. God knows the field of labor. He knows the need of the laborer. He knows the weariness that accompanies the task at hand, and he knows the peculiar difficulty of each and every field of labor. Rosa, how many times have we gone to the national meeting and heard the missionary ask, what about this and what about this? And, and the brother that's called in question will tune up to the mic and he'll go, well, brethren... The field where we are is just a hard field. It's just difficult there. And everybody said, there, isn't it everywhere? That should be a revelation to us. See, God knows the field. He knows the labor. He knows the task. He knows the weariness. He knows the peculiar difficulties. And the way he meets that is he gives us grace, mercy, and peace to make us sufficient to the task. I think we should conclude that this greeting was also a request to God. It was a prayer to God on behalf of these preachers and pastors. Notice how it's phrased. 
that they would receive the needed grace, mercy, and peace from God. You understand? No one else can supply it. It's great to have friends. It's great to have acquaintances. But when it comes to what you really need in your life, you can only get it from one place. You need grace, you need mercy, and you need peace. You need it from God, our Savior, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we come to the conclusion of the salutation or the introduction to the letter. See, Timothy faithfully labored for God. He, for one, heeded the admonitions from God that Paul gave him. I, I like this phrase. Timothy became a leader among followers. We're all shooting for that, aren't we? To become a leader among followers. <laughs> Philippians 2.20 says, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. That's a great compliment for Timothy, but at the same time, it's also a great condemnation about all the other people that Paul labored with. He said, look, I've got all these guys that have labored with me. He said, but I've only got one. If I send him to you, it would be just like me being there, and that's Timothy. Because he's learned to be like-minded, who will naturally care for your state. A little tidbit here in Hebrews 13, 25. It says, grace be with you all. By the way, he closed his letters the same way he opened them. Request for grace, peace. But notice the italicis that's written at the end after that verse. It tells us the book of Hebrews was written from Italy. Look who the penman was as Paul was dictating it. By Timothy. Yet some people say they don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The historian Eusebius says that ultimately Timothy was beaten to death by a mob at Ephesus because of his preaching of the gospel. Let me give you something real quick as we conclude. It's not in the slides. Paul got ran out of Ephesus. And Timothy was left behind. We're going to study it in detail next time, okay? Paul went over to Macedonia. They just said, you go ahead. We'll try to calm this, these people down. We'll, we'll, we'll meet up later. They did meet up later. John pastored at Ephesus. Eventually, Timothy goes back to Ephesus, and he's there faithfully preaching the gospel like he's been instructed by God through the Apostle Paul. And ultimately, those, some of those people who never get saved, you know, they get hardened to the gospel. That's where Timothy gave his life, according to history. The introduction, simple salutation. Paul writing to Timothy. But we get to listen in on these instructions. They're great and grand and, and they're for every one of us. We look forward to it, I hope. Uh, and if you don't like it, we'll just change subjects, all right? Okay. Or you can do like everybody else, I guess, just stay home. Mm -hmm. Verse 3 says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. See, it's right there. It doesn't happen now. We'll become full circle later in Timothy's life. He comes back by Ephesus, and that's where he meets his demise. Let's uh, stand together, please. We'll pray. We'll prepare for a verse of invitation. Lord, we understand as we bow to pray that in the generic sense, we're all your disciples. We're all called to be learners and followers of you. There is a technical term for the disciples that you personally train. And we, we, we understand those words, how the Bible teaches in the Gospels that you personally, uh, to borrow our word, mathematized them. And since that time, we are told as disciples to be mimickers of those that you personally mathematized. That's what it means to be a disciple. 
And in the generic term, we all have been sent forth as part of your church, as authorized people prepared to go and do a job representing you. But we also understand that technical distinction that the apostles that you trained and that you laid us the foundation of this work have passed, but you have preserved for us in these letters. What your Holy Spirit taught them was the way that we should live and act as church, as pastors, as members. And it would be greatly beneficial for us today in the days in which we live to study, to observe, to keep, and to guard them if we want to be faithful servants of yours. Forgive us where we fail. Pray that you'd help each of those who are not present tonight for sickness, that you encourage and strengthen them physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We do thank you for our veterans and the service that they've rendered. Pray you bless them for that. Pray for those uh, in the Northeast who are still suffering from the effects of the storm as they're being ministered to even now. We pray that you would help us always to understand that, that you're in control of all things. We do not always understand what you allow, but we know that as you promised that you can work all things for our good. We pray you just do that for us and bring glory to your name. We pray as we dismiss after this invitation, you keep us safe, particularly now. As you speak to our hearts, may we respond in a manner that will bring honor and glory to you, both not only tonight, but as a change in our lives, as long as you allow us to live, and ultimately through eternity, as we get opportunities to, to praise you, to state again in adoring language all the things that you've done for us. We pray and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What page is that? 248. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow. Really?
and grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within marvelous grace, given and grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Jonathan, would you dismiss